Welcome to EB-5 Investment Voice, where attorney insights intersects with immigration investments. If you are a foreign investor, domestic fund manager, or enterprising entrepreneur and want to get the most out of the EB-5 program, you have come to the right place. I'm Mark Deal, and I'll be your co-host on this journey. I'm joined by your host, Mona Shaw, and other attorneys at Mona Shaw & Associates, as well as immigration leaders from around the world. So let's get into EB-5 Investment Voice. Hello, 2024. (laughs) I have to say, Rebecca, Mark, 2023 was definitely an unusual year. It had program closures, major changes, and not just with the EB-5 program, but worldwide. Yeah, Mona, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, We've seen starting even from the end of 2022 going into 2023, we saw major changes to other programs. You know, we saw Ireland leaving. We saw other programs leaving at the end of 2022, which we can discuss further, but we saw the programs having a busy year. Right. Well, we do want to focus a little bit, not so much on the past, Rebecca, but on the future. And how much we can predict is going to happen in 2024, I suppose, does it depend a lot on what happened in 2023? Yeah, as we said, EB-5 came in with a bang in 2023. We're just coming off of the Reform and Integrity Act being implemented in 2022. I think, Mona, it took mostly everyone over a year. So going into 2023, trying to figure out where we are with the new rules. You know, we saw so many forms, which I think even today we're still trying to figure out. (laughs) Well, that's the alphabet. (laughs) You might remember, Mark, we did that silly little uh, video back in the end of 2022 with uh, the alphabets. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because the, the USCIS just brought out so many forms. So we're dealing with Fs and Hs and Ks and Es and... It was just like, it was just too much. It was not even just the forms, but I think what we're seeing today, you know, with all these forms out there, I feel like USCIS is struggling because we're not getting the right receipt notices. I think every case that we have filed, we're seeing what they call informal receipt notices, wrong people going in for biometric appointments. Even USCIS themselves are trying to get things together, even coming into 2024. Oh, so Rebecca, what is your prediction for USCIS's disarray for 2024? (laughs) Well, let's hope they can get their act together. Uh, No, but we're still seeing it. We're having to contact the IPO to make these changes. You've seen cases that are taking a bit longer than others, but you can't even make a formal request or inquiry because they're saying it's not a formal receipt notice. So we don't even have a proper case number. Hopefully, USCIS will see all of these issues from 2023 and, you know, make some changes coming into 2024. Hopefully. All right. So what, Rebecca, do we believe are the top countries for investors in 2024? Well, Mona, you know, (laughs) I mean, I know I'm from the U.S., but we're always seeing that U.S. has traditionally been the first choice for investors, right? But I think we're going to see a shift this year. Um, well, and, and we, I think to be very mm-hmm. fair, we've seen the pattern shifting in 2023, if, we, yes. if we're very fair. It's the very first time that we saw outbound investment from the U.S. really increase dramatically. Yes. Although there was quite a lot in 2022 when post-COVID was there with with people wanting to go to countries like Greece and Malta and yeah, Portugal. But I, think, I think more information is out there now. You know, COVID is kind of an anomaly and then people wanting to get out, didn't know what they're doing. But because of COVID, people can work from home. And that means you can live in other countries. I mean, I'm seeing this everywhere, especially in the European Union, everyone wanting to be somewhere else and and maybe even taking a month to travel, do things, but can also work from home. So we're seeing a lot of outbound, not only from the US, but also from the UK. Right. I think we might, 2024 might bring more more advances on the nomad visa, which we can discuss at a later time. Oh, yes. And this year, though, outbound wise from America, where did we see people coming and going? In 2022, it was Portugal. Yeah, well, that's a whole new issue itself, because we've seen, you know, the Portuguese program has changed. But now we're seeing Greece has risen tremendously. 
in the golden visa program from from the U.S. Right. Um, I actually, it's from around the world, not just the U.S. So we kind of measure the amount of people, Mark, from the numbers. So we know that there are ten thousand visas given to the U.S., and those ten thousand numbers are taken up every year, and there are backlogs. But bear in mind, the U.S. is the size of Europe, uh, the mm-hmm. whole of Europe. So if you <laughs> talk about one country like Greece which is just that little bitty little size, maybe the size of Florida, maybe a little bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and Greece apparently in 2023 pur- purportedly received something like close on 8,000 applications for its golden visa program. And that was double what it was in 2022, because I think it was 4,300 and something in 2020. What do you think is driving the popularity of Greece's golden visa program? I'm not going to tell you, Mark. You have to wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll discuss it later. <laughs> yeah, but I think just overall, we are seeing, like we said, the shift from those who, you know, Canada is popular, U.S. is popular, the U.K. is popular, but these other countries are now rising. And I think it's just, it's going to make a difference, and not even just in 2024, but just in the years to come. Rebecca, you mentioned programs being shut down. Uh, and in in 2020, was it 2022 or 2023 when Ireland was shut down? Yeah, that was the end of 2022. So was Montenegro was also closed. Um, so we're seeing a lot of programs that were closed due to a lot of compliance issues, securities issues. You know, we're also seeing, like we said, the Portuguese program hasn't closed, but because of some of these types of issues, they have made changes to the programs. Right. And there are new programs coming up. Yeah, I mean, new um, countries. I mean, we're seeing some I, this year. I think or just recently, was it the beginning of 2024? We yeah. saw um, a new program in for for residency by investments in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that, that was a shock. <laughs> <laughs> We saw Saudi Arabia, we saw El Salvador. 2023, we saw Dubai had a program as well. It's not mentioned as much, but there are programs out there. Mona, I know we talked about, will Hong Kong come back? You know, these, I don't know these- if Hong Kong will come back, though, because Hong Kong might have lost its charm. But anyway, let's see. But these smaller countries that you wouldn't have thought are coming out with the investment by immigration programs just because I think they're seeing the economic impact. A lot of them might be smaller programs, but at the same time, they need to make sure, like the U.S., the integrity measures are in place. Right. I think that is going to be one of the big things that we are going to see moving forward. And the integrity measures, regulatory issues, I think it's not just the U.S. I think we're going to see this in all countries, including the Caribbean. So without giving away too much about our future podcast, Rebecca, what are the changes in the Caribbean that you're seeing? Well, we saw that St. Kitts have made some changes. And so I think we're going to see more of the Caribbean countries trying to implement the same. And at the same time, we saw, unfortunately, the U.S. brought in that the E2 regulation. And so we might see some changes to Grenada or those trying to get to Grenada. Well, maybe Grenada will have less of a market share now that the E2 program has been sort of curtailed. Yeah, but I think it's going to, with the Caribbean, I mean, we've been in on some meetings, and again, not to give anything away because we want to, we'll be bringing these out in the next few weeks, but, you know, we've been in on some meetings where the Caribbean countries are probably going to see how do they work together, one, to make sure and ensure that all the countries are kind of adhering to the same rules and regulations, the same integrity measures. But we might see some more stringent compliances happening. You know, everyone just thought, oh, just go to the Caribbean, you could get in easily. But everyone's going to be surprised with some of the implementations coming out. Well, I think that the main reason for a lot of this is that 2024 is an election year for a lot of the world. And US, UK and the EU will continue, I believe, to pressure the residency and citizenship by investment programs to impose stricter conditions. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point, Mona. Uh, I mean, I can't even believe 2024 is here in the US (laughs) where, you know, some of these results coming out. I I mean, I'm surprised. I'm I'm actually waiting to see what's going to happen. (laughs) But yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that's going to make some of the changes to these programs. Okay, so away from from the global front, back to the US for a second. Rebecca, you did mention just now that just earlier that we're having trouble with 
receipt notices and, and USCIS really trying to implement the new law. But what are we seeing with regards to the EB-5 adjudication times? Because that has always traditionally been, I would say, the, the downfall of the EB-5 program, the time it takes. Because of RIA, the Reform and Integrity Act, I feel like now we have to talk about the EB-5 program in two, two different areas, right? We have to talk about pre-RIA cases and post-RIA cases. That's right. With post-RIA cases, we're seeing fast adjudication times. But again, these are because these are n- new applications. There's not as many. They did stipulate that they were supposed to review these cases within a year. So we have seen s- that happening. But unfortunately, I feel that it's actually made it worse for the pre-RIA cases. I'm seeing slower adjudication times. We're seeing a lot more denials, a lot more RFEs, noids coming out. And I why, think- why do you think that, Rebecca, considering that a lot of USCIS changed? Remember, we discussed in detail how they lost a lot of their staff members and replaced people. Do you think it's new adjudicators or do you think it's something else? I know they lost a lot of adjudicators in the past and they are having to bring some new new ones in. They're training, doing all of that. I get it. But they're adjudicating the new cases. I I mean, not to be a pessimist, but I just feel like they're just wanting to get rid of the backlog, that they're just trying to get through the pre-RIA cases and just getting them out with any RFE, any denials that they can. And I just feel like we're pretty much litigating most of the pre-RIA oh, yeah. cases. It's, it's very unfair. People have been waiting for years and years. I mean, on average, four to five years, basically yeah. because the EB-5 program was closed for a year, while well, the regional center program was closed for a year. And then, of course, we had the COVID and the election delays mm-hmm. and the USCS was backlogged anyway. So it's just very unfair that after four, five, six years, you know, USCS comes up with an RFE, which is or annoyed, which is just based on really not under, even understanding the industry or the project. Yeah. And, and it wouldn't have been if USCS had actually adjudicated these cases, even within two years. Right. Some of these questions that they're asking would not come up. You know, if you're going to take that long to adjudicate a case, then get rid of the I-29s because I'm sure projects can easily show everything by the time they adjudicate a case within four to five years. Absolutely. Okay, so that's pre-RIA cases and RIA being the B-5 Reform and Integrity Act, which came in in March 2022. What about the post-RIA cases? You mentioned that we are getting fast adjudications, adjudications as fast as 11 months. I will say that the 2023 did bring up the what's called the rural phenomena. What do you predict for 2024? A continuation? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think you and I have both discussed this, Mona. And I think we've even discussed this on previous podcasts that, yeah, if we're going to see more in that area and the TEA, just as long as they have visas. Yeah. And interestingly, that in the rural areas, we're seeing programs, non-real estate programs actually take off like uh, solar power. Yeah, I know everyone's so, you know, we have talked a lot about this, about real estate projects versus non-traditional. I think we're going to see a lot of that coming out in 2024. But again, as long as there are visas available, especially for India and China, because I predict that by the end of this fiscal year, we're going to see, I would say by next year, you might see backlog. For which category? For India and China, under the rural and TEA. The, under the new set aside categories. Yeah, uh, I think you might be right there. Yeah. All right. So last year, right at the beginning of 2023, mm. there was this big noise relating to fees because there was a f- complete and utter fury over USCIS's proposal to almost double and triple and quadruple fees. Oh, gosh. Yeah, we were, you know, it's. I think regional centers are going to feel the brunt of this because their fees, I mean, you know, went from almost 18000 to now a new I-956 fee of 47695 And on top of that, with the integrity fees and all the upkeep, what do you think, Benno? Are we going to see this come in this year? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. They just gave us a year for it to settle in. But uh, I think it was, well, you're the numbers person, Rebecca. What was it, a 2,004% jump? Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, and 2, I mean, 2,204, sorry. 204. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's funny because we said this too. I feel that investors, if they know that it's a good project, they might not feel it as much. But I think regional centers, projects, I am, um, you know, I think USCIS needs to kind of look back into it. It's fine if you're trying to set up a new regional center, 
right? Maybe if you pay a one-time fee of this forty-seven six ninety-five, but the fact that if you have to pay that fee because you need to make an amendment, like a name change, organizational changes, geographical scope changes. To pay that fee again, that's it's horrendous. So I think USCIS is going to have to go back and look at some of these issues. Well, you still pay fees in other in the other global programs. It's not just that you pay fees in the US. I mean, some of the fees for for some of these programs are quite high. But I think the difference really is is that in these other global programs, there are lesser people, perhaps, and it's a faster adjudication, or there just seems to be a little bit more. I don't know. You know. Things getting done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it is less investors. They, you know, because the U.S. is the whole immigration process. It's not just EB five we're dealing with. They're dealing with all the other types of visas, right? Non-immigrant visas, the the immigrant visas. I just think with the other programs, you you kind of know what to expect. It's a one time fee. Whereas to make changes like this, if you have to pay fifty thousand every time for that. That's going to be an issue. Well, I wonder if we're going to start seeing a different type of investor coming to the U.S. as opposed to some of these other global programs. Maybe investors who just want a second passport won't consider the U.S. at all, and only those who want to come here for the children's education or actually they want to live here. We'll see those people who are willing to wait and willing to pay more fees and willing to do. Whatever's required, because the U.S. program is still is different from all of the other programs around the world. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's you know mid January, and we've spoken to so, I've spoken to so many investors already who are looking at the U.S. as their second option. They're like, I want a passport. They're looking at the Caribbean programs. They're looking at Greece, all these other programs to get a passport that can allow them to travel visa free to more countries. But at the end of the day, they are still looking for that U.S. passport, and it's kind of like, hey, I'm going to put it on the back burner. It's fine that it takes a year or two to get the the green card. I'm not looking to move right away, but it's something that they want in their back pockets. But at the same time, they want that other passport to be able to travel. Yeah, and there's an interesting point.、Um, another interesting point, and you mentioned earlier that it's going to be more compliance, and there's going to be、uh, more regulatory interference. Perhaps 2024 will see less consultants and more lawyers in the industry. Maybe <laughs> we've always said that it is always、um, better to speak to the experts in the field. And then at the same time, though, you don't have to be a lawyer to be an expert, but、yeah. perhaps you you might get a little bit more detail. Well, lawyers are different anyway, because I think we we handle cases and we handle clients in a different manner. Yeah, and those regulatory issues you will know more in detail being a, a lawyer. At the same time, too, all these other programs. I mean, in the Caribbean, a lot of times you do deal with the lawyers. Right at the end of the day, they're the ones who are filing. They're the ones who are doing everything. So even if you came through an agent or someone like that, I still think it's like just make sure you you're speaking to the lawyer at the end of the day. Yeah, there might be a change. We we might be discussing a change, or we may not be discussing a change <laughs> in the way a lot of these these programs are dealt with.、Mm. One other interesting point, Rebecca. Despite the extra fees and the costs, we are seeing some of the old players just bow out of EB five, and a lot of new players come all over the world, from China to the US. Yes, Amona, we have seen that. I think it's it's just again、uh, USAIS with the regional center program needs to be a bit more clear on what how things are going through. You know, we do see a lot of players who are leaving, but they want to make sure that their investors are taken care of because a lot of them are still going through the EB five process. They haven't reached the I twenty nine stages as yet. So we've had, you know, coming out of twenty twenty three, we've seen issues with the integrity fund fee,、um, whether or not they pay it if they don't want to continue. We're like, if you want to, go ahead and pay it because you want to make sure your investors are safe. But we're seeing a lot of sales happening. I think that's what we're seeing a lot more of. Of like, even though what do you mean by sales? Players, sale of the regional centers. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so people who are just wanting to buy regional centers and setting them up, and these they're going for a lot of money. I've been listening, hearing prices: one hundred fifty, two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand, just for the purchase of a regional center. Yeah, I mean, we've seen that in the past as well, but now I think it's. The sales are going up. Things are happening. People are wanting to get out, but wanting to make sure investors are safe. 
So those who are coming in, um, we're obviously seeing a lot more due diligence because they want to make sure the regional center that they're taking over, you know, have they complied with everything? So yeah, I think we'll see a lot more of those transactions happening this year. Right. So as I said, I think we will see a lot more new players. I believe that uh, new regional centers are coming along with new players. But I also worry that uh, they don't know really what they're doing. And it takes it's there's a learning curve, especially when it comes to the US CB5 program. I know, Mona, you said you were going to see new players in the rural areas. Right, because right. there's not many regional centers in the rural areas. And if that's where a lot of these projects or a lot of these clients want to invest in, more regional centers are coming out in those rural areas. Well, yes, because I really don't know whether people want to rent because rental now has become expensive. It, mm -hmm. It's not, they're not that cheap anymore because there's just so much more liability involved in rentals. Even if you are renting a regional center and you're paying that much money, it's kind of cheaper to just do your own. Yeah. But like you were saying, I, I know I interrupted you, but you were saying that a lot of people are, are going to come in to do this not knowing what they're doing either. Right. And as we've had on our podcast over this year, as we've seen new players come in in places like China and India, and they don't really know the program either. So there's that learning curve which keeps going on. I feel like with the EB-5 program, we're always learning. Yeah. <laughs> this changes all the time or, or something happening. Um, kind of with EB-5, yeah, you do have to be on the ball with it. Well, going back to the Integrity Fund for a second, do you think we will see an Integrity Fund type fund coming out of other countries other than just the U.S.? Ooh, that's an interesting point. I don't know. Well, what's the purpose of the Integrity Fund? The purpose of the Integrity Fund is for regulatory compliance site visits to make sure that these projects are out there complying with uh, the regulations, right? Integrity measures. And That's it's set the by the purpose. government. Exactly. Whether or not other programs do that, I, I don't know. Because, again, are they, are they big enough? Are the fees that investors are already paying for these other programs, are they already complying Maybe you're right. Maybe we might see fee increases in those programs. I think we might, actually. And I think it depends on, on how governments share information. Yeah. But if there is one general integrity fund fee, although many countries already do do a due diligence fee, which is wrapped into their own fees. Exactly. That's why their fees are a bit higher to start with. But you know, it's a one-time fee. You kind of know what you're getting into. And, and again, these programs are different, right? It's not the developers or the projects who are paying these fees, like the regional center is paying those integrity fees. It's actually the investors who are paying those fees. You know, Mona, Rebecca, I love these episodes. Every year, the beginning of the year, we always predict, you know, what is coming <laughs> up? What's coming up over the next 12 months? And then at the end of the year, we do an end of year wrap up. And I got to say, we are more accurate than not. I think the times that uh, we're <laughs> yeah. off is when, oh, USES is going to do a thing and they do it. But then we... I guess, overestimate the speed of government. <laughs> They're like a year behind. But that being a year? said... A year? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> you know which uh, issue I'm talking about and thinking about. And yeah, it took a couple more years. But, you know, this is the first year that I, I really heard from both you ladies that uh, a bigger focus on the global investment opportunities and the impact of what that means to, uh, to us and to our listeners. Well, Mark, that's really because there's so much more happening. As I said right at the beginning of this podcast, this is the first time we are seeing so much more outbound. When I say outbound, I mean people from the U.S. actually actively getting a second passport or maybe dumping their U.S. passport <laughs> and going to countries like Montenegro and Portugal, Greece, uh, and all these type of places. That's a phenomenon which just didn't happen before. And I think a lot of the changes which we are seeing, uh, Rebecca, I'm sure you're going to agree with me, are really as a result of COVID, maybe the nomad visa, maybe the ease of being able to work overseas. Yes, I think that's going to be, a, um, it's, you know, it's, happen it's happening already. And I think more and more people, once they use the nomad visa, travel, but then they're going to look for that second passport for a more permanent stay. But I also think, too, that, you know, it's been years since these programs have been up and running. And it's now coming to fruition, like how they're working. We, you know, more compliance is needed, more integrity measures are needed. So I think they're, each country is looking at what, what are the others doing and kind of taking ideas and, and making changes. Like, 
like we said, Canada and Portugal got rid of their investment visas, but they're doing it based on other types, like entrepreneurial and investing into other projects that way rather than real estate investments. So all of these programs are, are looking to see where's everyone going. And I think that's why we're seeing so much more. Well, yes. And also countries are seeing this as a great income source. Mm -hmm. And people who are moving are looking at other factors. They're now looking at quality of life, taxes, yes. and proximity to perhaps relatives overseas. Because the U.S. is quite far from most of the other the countries the in the world. Yeah. Well, look, it's going to be a global market. I think eventually everyone's going to have multiple passports. And you know what? Stay tuned because we're here to give more information on all these other countries. Yeah, we certainly do, Rebecca and Mona. We're looking forward to this and more in 2024. Thank you for being with us today on EB5 Investment Voice. The topics presented in this podcast is informational in nature and is not to be taken as specific legal advice. If you have questions on the topics presented in this episode or other investment immigration needs, please contact Mona Shaw and Associates. Mona and her attorney staff can be reached at mshawlaw.com. That's M S H A H law.com. Make sure you don't miss our next episode focusing on a different aspect of the EB-5 program by subscribing to the podcast. While you're at it, leave us a rating on iTunes. If you really found this episode valuable, share it with someone else that could benefit from this information. Until then, I'll see you on the next episode of EB-5 Investment Voice.